The Lord Jesus said, Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. As for this verse, I could never quite comprehend it. What does being saved really mean? What does it have to do with entering the kingdom of heaven? These questions have plagued me for over 20 years. Only when Almighty God's end time word came, His word finally put an end to my confusion. Being saved into the kingdom of heaven is a mystery. If Almighty God had not revealed this mystery, man would never ever understand. You're right. Almighty God's end-time work has revealed all mysteries, explaining the truth that we believers didn't understand before. Thank God. Thank God. God. It took me 20 years, and the road has been bumpy until today. If not for God's salvation in the last days, if I had continued in my walk with God, just believing in my own way, the final result would have been total destruction. But I had never thought that God's end time chastisement and judgment would thus come upon me, letting me hear His voice and understand the truth He expresses and bringing me before His presence. God's end time salvation is indeed marvelous. Right. Oh, I really yes. appreciate it. White he brother, we've got to sit a lot in this Bible study. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. visiting him tonight. Oh, thank you, Lord. We have to pray My to the Lord and may the, the Lord Bible. bless you. Oh, yes, thank no, the Lord. No, no, no. Of course, may the Lord be with you. Co-workers, let's end today's Bible study meeting. Does anyone still have any questions? No, 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 no questions. Thank the Lord. Thank, thank the Lord. Lord. Thank the Lord. Brother Fan, there's a question that's been troubling me. What is it? Go ahead. The Lord Jesus said, Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now every one of us often sins and often confesses. This is not doing the will of our Father. Do you think people like us could enter the kingdom of heaven? Uh, well, yes, yeah, why can we can't we enter the kingdom of heaven? heaven? How can so we be important. shut out of it? From what I, I, I read, right. I think that we... We all often sin and confess. How can we enter the kingdom of heaven? I don't How understand. Can we enter the kingdom, can we enter the kingdom of heaven? From what I read, I think out of the kingdom of heaven. Brother Wu, it looks like our knowledge of salvation is still inadequate. The book of Romans says, For with the heart man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Amen. To confess with our mouth, and believe in our heart is all we must do. Righteousness through faith means we are hence forever saved. Amen. When our Lord comes again, He will bring us directly into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Brother Wu, we shouldn't have any misgivings about this. Yeah. You're right. Thank the Lord. We're already saved. We'll enter the kingdom of heaven. What's there to doubt, really? Yeah, yes, that's can right. Can we that's enter the kingdom question. of heaven? I don't think so. The Lord Jesus said, But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. 
Although we are saved, we're still sinning by day and confessing by night. We're still not doing the will of our Father in heaven. We can't enter the kingdom of heaven yet. Amen. Amen. Yes. Brother, but don't forget, Paul in the book of Galatians says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Since we are children of God by believing in Jesus, surely we can enter the kingdom of heaven. That's Amen. Right. right. I You're don't right. understand. Brother Long, I wouldn't approve of what you said. The scripture says, You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Although we have been saved, this does not mean that we are holy, because we often sin and confess and are not worthy to see our Lord's face. How can we enter the kingdom of heaven? How? Often How can sin. we? I, it would be How impossible. Can we enter the kingdom I, of heaven? I just don't know. Yeah, How? Yeah. Fellow co-workers, Paul in the book of Romans has already told us clearly, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus has forgiven us all our sin, both sins we committed in the past and those we'll commit in the future, have been forgiven by the Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord no longer sees us as sinners. We can certainly enter the kingdom of Amen. heaven. Amen. We cannot have doubts over this. That's right. Paul in the book of Romans also says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We are no longer under condemnation because we believe in Jesus Christ. Yes. We shouldn't worry. We'll enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Well, Brother Roy's right. worry is right. unnecessary. Yeah. It's unnecessary. We definitely we can How enter. How could we enter? I don't know. Brothers and sisters, since the scripture has said that, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, and even the Lord Jesus said, only he who does the will of the heavenly Father can enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. This is sufficient proof that only they who attain holiness can enter the kingdom of God. Yeah, Amen. you're right. Amen. That's right. That's Lord Jesus has forgiven all our sins kingdom. and doesn't regard us as sinful. We have to Aren't make we holy holy already? Already? My fellow co-workers, on the question of being saved, Paul has already told us all clearly, for by grace are you saved through faith, and if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. Amen. Amen. The Lord's salvation is freely given by grace and does not depend on human works. If this depended on human works, how can we call this Lord's grace? Amen. Amen. Now we can enter the kingdom of heaven based on the Lord's grace. Amen. Amen. Brother Fan is right. Paul in the book of Timothy also said, God who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and grace. We who believe in Jesus enter the kingdom of heaven based on grace. If it were based on works, who then could be saved? Yeah. We yeah. just live by the Nobody grace of Jesus saved. Christ. Brothers and sisters, whether we believers can enter the kingdom of heaven is decided by what the Lord Jesus said or what Paul said. By, by what, what the Lord, Lord Jesus said. said. Is it Lord Jesus' words that have authority or Paul's words that have authority? The Lord Jesus' words have authority. Do we confess that the Lord Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Of course, of course we, we confess. confess. Good. Since we confess that the Lord Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and what Paul said and what our Lord Jesus said are contradictory and are opposite, that would mean that what Paul said is impure. It comes from human will and is not the truth. I would rather believe what our Lord Jesus said. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. It's the standard for entering the kingdom of heaven. Right. The word of the Lord Jesus is unshakable truth. But are Paul's words not the truth? Not the words in the Bible? We should listen and obey everything that is in the Bible. What Paul has said sounds more simple. No suffering, no price to pay, and still we can be saved. Isn't this better? Amen. Amen. Yes. Is that possible? Oh my. Brothers and sisters, I feel... We who believe in God should make the words of Lord Jesus a standard, because Lord Jesus is the Lord of the kingdom of heaven. His word is the only truth, the only authority. If his words carry authority, then what he says counts. Paul isn't the Lord of the kingdom of heaven. His words don't carry authority, nor do they count. Paul was nothing more than an apostle with a corrupt human nature. He himself needs God's salvation. 
whether he can enter the kingdom of heaven is still decided by the Lord Jesus. What right does he have to decide if others can enter or not? Co-workers, about being saved into the kingdom of heaven, let us all return and seek answers through prayer. We'll end today's meeting here. Let us pray. Our father had a backache. Is he any better now? Hmm. Much better. Thank the Lord. Guo Yi. Hmm. About today's co-worker meeting, I think Brother Wu is right. Paul is not the Lord of the Kingdom of Heaven. He can't decide if man can enter the Kingdom of Heaven. Lord Jesus is the King of it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Only his words can decide if we can enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord Jesus speaks the truth, but Paul's words were inspired by God. They're also the truth. Is there anything wrong in following Paul's words? If you believe in God, why not follow Lord Jesus' words? Why do you insist on following Paul's words? Do you trust in Lord Jesus or in Paul? Who exactly do you believe in? What do you know? How many times have you read the Bible? Since Paul's words are recorded in the Bible, they must have come from God. If we follow Paul's words, we're not wrong. The Pharisees knew the Scripture very well, yet they nailed our Lord Jesus to the cross. Does knowing the Scripture mean knowing the Lord? The Pharisees were hypocrites. They followed man's teaching and made God's commandments void. I'd say that you're no different from them, exalting man's words, following man's words, instead of the Lord's. You're actually calling me a Pharisee? Calling me a hypocrite? I've served the Lord for over 20 years. What gives you the right? How dare you? I need rights to teach you? What's that supposed to mean? That's just arrogant. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Go ye. No matter how difficult it gets in the future, you must watch over our Lord's flock. Let our brothers and sisters take root and grow on the path to holiness. That is a wise and faithful servant. And I believe that there will be a crown of righteousness laid up for us.
Recently, there are more weaker brothers and sisters in the church, and some of those who have been more actively seeking God have embraced the Eastern Lightning. What's going on? What's going on? I don't understand. In order to protect the flock, we must dismiss all those who embrace the Eastern Lightning from our church. As the Lord's servants, we must be faithful to the Lord. We must visit the believers and watch over the flock. We cannot let these Eastern Lightning followers steal our good sheep any longer. Brother Fan, what the Eastern Lightning followers are preaching, we've never heard. You're blindly driving the brothers and sisters who embrace the Eastern Lightning from the church. Does this conform to the Lord's heart? Yes, Brother Wu is right. If we're really thinking about the flock, we should take the initiative to examine what the Eastern Lightning is all about, to see if what Almighty God expresses is the truth, and if Almighty God is the return Jesus Christ. If the Eastern Lightning is the true way, we should be bringing our brothers and sisters to it. If what they're spreading is not the true way, then we'd be able to answer to our brothers and sisters. What's there to examine? Surely Brother Fan would know if it's the true way or not. And we support his plan. Dismiss everyone who embraces the Eastern Lightning. To protect the flock, Brother Fan is right. I'm doing this out of responsibility for the lives of our brothers and sisters. If we do not seal up the church and not dismiss everyone who embraces the Eastern Lightning, in no time at all, all of our good sheep would be stolen away by them. How can we answer to the Lord? That settles it. It is decided. So now, we'll end today's discussion about the work of our church. Is there anything else? Nothing, Nothing much. No. Thank, Thank the Lord. Lord. Brother Fan, about being saved and entering the kingdom of heaven, we didn't come to a conclusion. I think these two things are not one and the same. Yes. Why do we tell us the same thing? I don't understand. So how do you see it then? I think that being saved means being free from the condemnation of the law. It refers to sins being forgiven. But those who are saved can still oppose and rebel against God through sin. While those who enter the kingdom of heaven ought to be those who do the will of our Father in heaven, who obey God's word. They are those who know and submit to God, who are compatible with God. So being saved and entering the kingdom of heaven are two different matters. Many are saved, but few enter into the kingdom of heaven. Yes, the Lord that is so. We surely can enter the kingdom of heaven. It is the Lord's will. I agree with you. Anything that brings us to We surely can enter the kingdom of heaven. My fellow co-workers, I agree with Brother Wu's point of view. The Lord Jesus said, "The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force." It's not so easy to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not just about. Relying on grace, we must actively follow the Lord's way before we can enter the kingdom of heaven. Absolutely. Not without we must trust in the Lord's way, way and do all we can to enter, the kingdom, can can enter the, kingdom the kingdom of heaven. Brother Wu, I agree that you are right. To enter the kingdom of heaven is to do the will of our Heavenly Father. But haven't we been imitating Paul, setting everything aside for the Lord's work, laboring and paying the price? Is this not doing the will of our Heavenly Father? Yes, oh, that's, that's right. what it is. That's what it you is. See? We believe that if we persevere to the end, we will enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Brother Fan is right. We follow the Bible's teaching, spreading the gospel, suffering for the Lord, preaching everywhere, watching the flock. That is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. Yes, I think so. Does doing the Heavenly Father's will only mean that? I wouldn't see it that way. The Lord Jesus has never said that. If we laid everything else aside and labored for him, we would enter the kingdom of heaven. The Lord Jesus said, But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. I say, those who truly do the will of the heavenly Father should be those who love God with their heart, their soul, and their mind. They have attained holiness and never sin. Only they can enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen.
Right. The Lord Jesus said, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. The righteous here are not those justified by faith, but those who do the works of righteousness and never sin. While we may now lay all aside for the Lord's work, we still sin and are not truly righteous. We are not worthy to enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Amen. Aren't we are not the creatures that we are not entitled to. We, of course, can enter the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. My fellow co-workers, regarding entering the kingdom of heaven, the Apostle Paul has shown us the route. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. From now on there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Amen. Amen. What Paul said is enough to prove that when we spread the gospel, labor and suffer, and keep the faith, we are doing the will of our Heavenly Father and the works of righteousness. Amen. Amen. In doing this, we can surely gain the crown of righteousness and enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Right. We only need to imitate Paul, spending ourselves on the Lord's work, subduing ourselves, and we will have a part in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Sister, based on what you have said, the Pharisees had traveled over land and sea, suffering hardships for spreading the gospel everywhere and exhibiting some outwardly good behaviors. Were they then doing the will of our Heavenly Father? The Pharisees yeah, during the didn't kingdom suffer a lot, but very they weren't approved by the Lord. Outwardly, the Pharisees appeared to be suffering for the sake of God, but they could still oppose God and nail Jesus to the cross. That's sufficient to prove that outwardly suffering and good behaviors do not represent doing the will of our Heavenly Father, nor knowing and submitting to God. Yes, Outward good outwardly. behavior. One may look like they're very well behaved, the Lord. but not really doing the true. will of the Lord. Very true. Today, we labor and suffer for the Lord and have some outwardly good behaviors, but we can still sin and oppose God. We are not following the will of our Heavenly Father. We're not worthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Right. 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 They still won't get us into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, yes, that's, that's right. right. Yes. That's that's right. 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 I, agree. I know exactly yes. what she's saying. Is agree. there something wrong in striving according to what Paul said? Not at all. I believe that Paul is never wrong in what he said. Amen. Said. It can't be wrong. Right. Paul said that if we toil and labor for the Lord, there'll be a crown of glory laid up for us. Whatever the case, I firmly Believe that what Paul said is the truth. Amen. Amen. We aren't wrong to follow what Paul said. Exactly. We aren't wrong. Brothers and sisters, entering the kingdom of heaven is not about following Paul. It's about what Jesus said. Amen. What Paul taught us is not to follow the will of our heavenly Father. It is his own view on entering the kingdom of heaven. It's the opposite of what Lord Jesus said. Are we going to believe that Paul's word is the truth or that the word of our Lord Jesus is the truth? Lord, Lord Jesus' Jesus word is the truth. truth. Are we going to trust in our Lord Jesus or in Paul? We, we trust, trust in our Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. But what yes. about but what, what Paul, Paul, said. Paul said? Only Lord Jesus' word is the truth. We believe in God, so Lord Jesus' word is our standard. That's what I've been saying. We have to follow Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must follow the word of our Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus is the gate to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Mm. Yes, 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 I agree. Yes. Indeed, the Lord Jesus' word is the truth, but Paul's word is inspired by God. It comes from God. It is also the truth. Amen. There is nothing wrong in following Paul's word. Amen. Amen. Right. There, is there is nothing, nothing Brother wrong. Brother Fan, are you guaranteeing that Paul's word comes from God and is inspired by God? Is Paul's word the truth or not? Lord Jesus' word is the truth. Man. Entering the kingdom of heaven is very They weren't approved of Jesus' word is true. Lord Jesus' word is the truth. Brothers and sisters, in the time of the apostles, when the believers received Paul's letters, who treated his word as the word of God? Exactly. The answer is nobody treated his word as God's word. Paul is not Christ. He, like us, is a corrupt human being. He once was the chief persecutor of God. What he said is man's word, 
It's not the truth. Amen. Yeah, Paul's word is not the truth. Paul was right. just a man. And during this discussion, God. God. So how can his word be the truth? It doesn't make sense. sense. My co-workers, the fact that Paul's words were recorded in the Holy Bible means that they were God's inspiration, God's words, and the truth. Amen. Amen. Right. Why else would Paul's words be recorded in the Holy Bible? Right. right. So how do we know if all the words in the Bible, in the Bible are, are God's words? I don't want to hear anymore. Exactly. How can we tell? Exactly. Brothers and sisters, does that mean that everything recorded in the Bible is inspired by God and that it is the word of God? The words of Satan and of the Pharisees are also recorded in the Bible. Are we going to say that they were also inspired by God or that they are also the truth? Mm -hmm. You say that all that is recorded in the Bible is the truth and is God's word. That's wrong. A fallacy. That's profaning what God says. Amen. Amen. That's right. The Bible includes what was said by humans and Satan, and they're not the truth. It's only God's word that is the truth. Then why would Paul's words be written in the Bible? Brother, the Bible was compiled by man, not by our Lord Jesus, nor was its compilation instructed by the Holy Spirit. Paul's letters being compiled into the Bible were a human compilation out of human will. Um, oh, yes, it's, it's, it's a simple was just a written and written over again by man, not by God. This was compiled by man. How else would it get written? This is not Christ's words. Not the word of man. Will ye? Dinner time. Okay. Yi. Hmm? About today's meeting, I feel that what Brother Wu and Guo Ming said makes sense. Sense? What sense? We believe in the Lord, and we should strive according to our Lord Jesus' word. If we follow what Paul said, I don't think that's right. The Lord Jesus' word is authority, and Paul's word is not. Why do you always exalt Paul's word? The word of Lord Jesus is authority. But what Paul said isn't wrong. Paul worked for the Lord all his life, and he suffered a great deal. For over 2,000 years, Paul has been the model for all Christians, hasn't he? Is it wrong to try to live like Paul? How does what Paul said go against the truth? Why are you so stubborn? Lord Jesus said, only he who does the will of the Heavenly Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. Can you promise that anyone who follows Paul's word will enter? You are the elder of the church. If you go down the wrong path, you would be a blind guide. If you mislead the brothers and sisters, that would be a terrible sin. You're saying that I'm leading blindly? For over 20 years, I have been studying the Bible, spreading the gospel, establishing churches, and shepherding the flock. Isn't that doing the will of our Heavenly Father? It just can't be wrong to lead the believers in this way. Why do you keep opposing me? You're a grown man, yet you throw a tantrum? After just two sentences, you're throwing your chopsticks and bowl. What are you trying to prove? Are you eating or not? Not eating? Forget it! Save it, such a weak person. I have fought 
a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Brother Lee, you accepted the Eastern Lightning of your own accord. Isn't this leaving the straight and narrow? How can you answer to our Lord? Brother Lee, we should be responsible for our own lives. Whatever happens, we cannot lead the Lord's way. Brother Fan, Brother Lang, I'll listen to you. I'll drop contact with them. Thank, Thank the, the Lord. Lord. Don't receive the Eastern Lightning followers anymore. Do you know the consequences of this? We must hold fast to the word given to us by our Lord Jesus. Anyone saying, our Lord has already come, is quite simply a heretic. You must never embrace it again. They are misleading people. Never deal with them again. All right. If they come again, I'll no longer receive them or listen to them. Oh, that's right. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Brother Fawn, I'll listen to you. Whatever they say, I won't believe them. I promise. Brother Fawn, don't worry. I'll return the book to them tomorrow. Thank the Lord. Next time the church will recommend and send out books. Don't read other books unless you have permission from the church. Okay. Fan Guoyi, Brother Wu has served the Lord for many years. He's upright. How can you dismiss him from the church? He did things without consulting me. He privately embraced the Eastern Lightning. How can I not dismiss him? And he did it behind my back. How could he? That was very arrogant of you. He believes in the Lord, and not you. Don't you talk about love? Don't you talk about being long-suffering? Don't you often say that you're the Lord's faithful servant? Where is your love for the brothers and sisters? Why don't you help him understand the truth? Instead of driving him away, do you deserve to be called the Lord's servant? Have love towards him! Not only did he accept the Eastern Lightning, but he stole so many of our good sheep. I built this church up through so much hardship. I should let him destroy it? He dared to bring in people to steal my sheep. I had to dismiss him. I'm faithful to the Lord, protecting the flock. That's just so shameless of you, Fang Gui. Which sheep belongs to you? Which church belongs to you? It's all the Lord's. You rally under the banner of protecting the sheep. But do you think I don't know what you're truly thinking? You're driving them out only to protect your position and reputation. Fang Guoyi, do you really think you're a true believer? Why are you always seeking after position instead of following the Lord's word? Why are you always opposing me? I'm telling you, in this church what I say counts. I will dismiss whomever I want. You're speaking out of turn. This is not your place. Be quiet! Save Goyi. What's the matter with him, O oh Lord?
In every instance, Jinjuan has been exposing me. In fact, everything she said is true. Dismissing the brothers and sisters isn't in line with the Lord's heart. I don't have any truth inside me. Seeing the brothers and sisters who pursue more actively left to believe in the Eastern Lightning. I'm unable to talk them out of it in any way. Oh Lord, can there be truth in the Eastern Lightning? Before, I knew that only those who do the will of the Heavenly Father can enter the Kingdom of Heaven. But how exactly to attain that, I never had any way to go about it. Thank God. Now I finally understand. Man must experience God's end-time judgment before he can do the will of the Heavenly Father. Yes. These days I've been listening to your fellowship. I understand more now than in 10 years of believing in the Lord. Thank God. Thank God uh -huh. so much. Thank God. Having read the words of Almighty God, I finally understand. If not for God's end time judgment and purification by His word, we humans corrupted to the core would never be holy and enter the kingdom of God. That's right. When man has his corrupt disposition resolved and no longer sins and opposes God, when he can truly submit to God, worship Him, and be compatible with Him, he is one who does the will of God, and who has been saved. Ah, Looping, could you find time to talk to my elder brother and his wife about God's end time work? Certainly. Let's go tomorrow. Hmm, good. Then we will do that. Brothers and sisters, Concerning who can enter the kingdom of heaven, the Lord Jesus said, Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. The Lord Jesus' word tells us clearly that only those who do the will of the heavenly Father can enter the kingdom of heaven. What exactly does it mean to do the will of the heavenly Father? We can set aside all things to spread the gospel, and shepherd the church. Such toil and labor is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. Is there any wrong in the way we carry this out? Not at all. We spread the gospel and watch over the Lord's church. That's doing the will of our Heavenly Father. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we can spread the Lord's gospel and toil and labor, but this does not mean we're doing the will of our Heavenly Father. Truly doing the Heavenly Father's will is following His words and commandments, and doing our duty according to His requirements. Just like what the Lord Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Doing the Heavenly Father's will means following and practicing what the Lord Jesus currently says. This is the most basic principle. If we do not focus on obeying the Lord Jesus' words, but on obeying man's words in the Bible, that is not doing the Heavenly Father's will. Doing the will of God is following the Word of God. If people always exalt the Apostle's word in the Bible, and not the word of the Lord Jesus, then they are not doing God's will, but are opposing God. People who do the will of God will submit to and practice whatever he says or does. They can accept God's commission and testify him and no longer rebel against or resist him. Such people are the holy ones. For example, Abraham. He was able to listen to God, sincerely willing to give his only beloved son back to God. Because of his absolute obedience, God blessed his descendants to be a great nation. Another example, Job feared God and kept away from evil. Even when tested with the loss of his possessions and children, 
he would rather curse himself than murmur against God. He still praised Jehovah's holy name. So, in the eyes of God, he was perfect. There's also Peter. He followed the Lord Jesus all his life, thirsting and seeking after the truth. After he received the Lord's commission, he abided by the Lord's will and requirements to shepherd the church, finally submitting even to death and loving God to the utmost. They were all people who obeyed and feared God. Such people are those who truly do the will of the Heavenly Father. If toil and labor is all there is to doing the Heavenly Father's will, then why did the Pharisees travel over land and sea, spreading the gospel, toiling and laboring only to receive the condemnation and curse of the Lord Jesus? That's because they believed in God, but were not walking in His way. When the Lord Jesus came for His new work, not only did they not embrace Him, but they instigated the common believers to wildly condemn and oppose Him, even setting up false witnesses to frame Him. All that they did was to depart from the Lord's way and make an enemy with Jesus. Even if they outwardly suffered a lot or did much work, how can they be said to be doing the will of the Heavenly Father? Based on that, people who only toil and labor outwardly but do not carry out the words of the Lord are not followers of the Heavenly Father's will. Exactly. Like Abraham and Job, people who submit to God, listen to His word, and witness for the Lord are those who do the Father's will and can enter the kingdom of heaven. If we measure by these standards, then there aren't many people who are truly doing the will of the Heavenly Father. The Pharisees did not do God's will, but opposed Lord Jesus. What does that have to do with us? Now, we believe in the Lord Jesus. We suffer a lot and sacrifice all to preach His name. That means we're already holy. I ask you, isn't this doing God's will? Absolutely. We fervently work for the Lord and will spend anything. We are doing the Heavenly Father's will. Our Lord will surely bring us into the kingdom of Amen. heaven. Brothers and sisters, Although people can suffer and sacrifice for spreading the name of the Lord, it's undeniable that they still often sin. That people's sin shows that they still belong to Satan, that they are filthy and corrupt, and that they can still resist and betray God. This proves no man is truly pure. If they take power, they can still oppose God and build separate kingdoms. This is proof that no one has been truly purified to become holy. How could those who resist God be qualified to enter the kingdom of heaven? People can sacrifice for the Lord, spread the gospel, build churches, and support believers. These are all their good behaviors. If their good behaviors are done for loving God, for truly working for God, and for obeying and satisfying God without any thought of personal gain, these are truly good deeds that will be remembered and be blessed by God. But if their good behaviors are done for an exchange, for satisfying fleshly needs, or entering the kingdom of heaven and getting rewards, then these good behaviors are merely deceptive in nature and are against God. Can these deceptive behaviors claim to be following the heavenly Father's will? Can they claim to be holy? Absolutely not because these good behaviors are driven by their sinful nature and are tokens of exchange for privilege. It shows that there is too much mingled in their hearts. How could such people have a heart that truly loves God and obeys God? People are driven and controlled by their sinful nature. When God's work and words clash with their views, they casually judge God, deny God, and condemn God. When God puts them through trials, they misunderstand God, complain against God, and betray God. While people believe in God, they worship and follow man, and listen to man before God. When serving God, they do it arbitrarily, raise and testify themselves, making an enemy of God. They are bound and controlled by their sinful nature, and given power, they'll surely oppose God and build separate kingdoms just like the chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees in the religious world. When the Lord Jesus came to do His work, they scrambled to condemn and resist Him to protect their own positions 
and kept his salvation from ever being accepted into the religious world. Is that not building a separate kingdom in opposition to God? So for all those who labor and display good behaviors outwardly, if they haven't dealt with their sinful nature, if their satanic disposition within is not purified, no matter how much they suffer or how great the work they do, how can such people become followers of God's will? Those who follow God's will are surely those who obey God absolutely, whose hearts are in accordance with God's heart, and who would never rebel or go against God. It is they who are qualified to enter the kingdom of heaven and inherit God's promises. What you say here makes sense, but the Apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Amen. Amen. And so, if we act according to Paul's words, we are following the will of God and will enter the kingdom of heaven and be rewarded. Amen. Those were the words of Brother Paul. How? Could it be that Brother Paul was mistaken? Do as Brother Paul did, and toil to do good works. That is the key by which we enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as to who may enter the kingdom of heaven, the Lord Jesus has already said, But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. This fully shows the essence of God's righteousness and holiness. The filthy, corrupt man of Satan can't enter the kingdom of heaven. But Paul said he fought a good fight and finished his course and kept the faith so he could enter the kingdom of heaven and be rewarded. According to Paul, if people simply work hard for the Lord, they can enter the kingdom of heaven, even if they don't follow God's word and are not holy. Then how should God's righteousness and holiness be known? In saying that, Paul is totally hostile to God. He's denying the words of Lord Jesus and is disrupting and disturbing God's work. So, is simply fighting a good fight and finishing the course following the Heavenly Father's will? Is simply holding on to the name of Lord Jesus without betraying the Lord following the Heavenly Father's will? Following the Heavenly Father's will is following God's words, His commandments, and his instructions. If men don't act according to the Lord's word, their labor has nothing to do with doing the will of the Father which is in heaven. Paul's words were born purely of his own notions and imagination, and were mixed with his own intents and ideas. This is enough to show that Paul was not really doing the Heavenly Father's will. If he were a man who did God's will, why did he not teach the believers to follow the words of Lord Jesus? Why did he preach notions that betrayed the words of Lord Jesus and went directly against his teachings? He used his own absurd views to mislead and deceive others, obstructing others from walking the way of Lord Jesus and making his word hollow. He asked men to follow him and betray the Lord. This shows us that Paul was not a seeker of truth or a follower of God's will. Brothers and sisters, the words of Lord Jesus are our guide to entering the kingdom of heaven, because he is the king of the kingdom of heaven, and only his words are the truth and the authority. Only the Lord Jesus can decide who can enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul was only an apostle who spread the gospel. He was not Christ, and his words are not the truth. So, what he said doesn't count. Only the Lord Jesus could decide if he himself would enter the kingdom of heaven. How could Paul judge whether others would be qualified to enter? If we compare Paul's words with those of the Lord Jesus, the words of the Lord Jesus have authority. His words are the truth. Paul's words have no authority and are not the truth. Paul's words came from his human imagination, not from the Holy Spirit. If they had been truly inspired by the Holy Spirit, how could they clash with the Lord's words? Hmm. Using Paul's words as a guide to enter, the kingdom of heaven is straying from the Lord's way. You all say Brother Paul's words aren't the truth. 
If that's so, why are his words in the Bible? Since Paul's words are in the Holy Bible, they are inspired by God, and they represent God's words, words that we have to pursue. Amen. Amen. Brother Paul's words are recorded in the Bible. That makes them the words of God. Exactly. All of Christianity acknowledges this. No one would dare deny it. Amen. Amen. We have been pursuing according to the Apostle Paul's words. Are we wrong to do so? Hmm. Brothers and sisters, although Paul's words are indeed in the Bible, that does not represent they are God's words. The Bible was composed by men, not by Jehovah God himself, nor was it composed by the Lord Jesus or the Holy Spirit. How could something composed by men be perfect? In the Bible, the words of Jehovah, the words he told his prophets, and the words of the Lord Jesus are God's words. God has never testified that the words of the apostles represent his words, nor has God testified that the words of the apostles are inspired by him. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is the word of Paul. The Holy Spirit never testified to that, nor did the Lord Jesus. Only Paul himself spoke those words, so his words are unfounded. In their time, the apostles wrote letters to different churches. And people would say that these were the words of Brother Paul or Brother Peter. They all knew that the apostles' letters were indeed the words of men. None of them would treat these letters as the words of God. That is a historical fact. No one can deny it. In the age of grace, only the Lord Jesus was God incarnate, and only he could express God's word. The apostles were men used by the Lord, and when they spoke, they spoke the words of man. Their words only represented their own understanding and experience of God's words, even if some were inspired by the Holy Spirit, but they were not God's words. Even Paul himself didn't dare claim that his words were God's words, or the inspiration of God. Nor did he claim to speak for the Lord Jesus. So, if we try to claim that Paul's words are also God's words, and obey them as we obey God's word, because they are in the Bible, we are making a mistake. Yes. How can they, they say it's a mistake? It's unfair to judge the Lord. I have never thought about Paul's letters that way. What are we doing? It seems the Paul's letters are truly not God's words. How can the Lord's word be taken as God's word? The Bible was put together by men, not by God. Why didn't we realize this fact? This is where we made our mistake. That's right. In the time of the apostles, people wouldn't treat Paul's words as the words of the Lord Jesus. You are right. Why didn't we think of that? That's how it was in history. It must have been that way. Right. For almost 2,000 years, people all treat Paul's words as God's words. How could we have been so ignorant? We thought Paul's words were the words of God just because they were in the Bible. That way of thinking must be mistaken. It goes against history. Brothers and sisters, why do people worship the Bible and blindly trust it? Because they don't know it was composed by men, which is not according to God's will. So they place blind faith in it and worship it, taking every word of it as God's word. That goes against historical fact and comes from human ignorance. Let's look at what Almighty God says. Paul's letters in the New Testament to the churches were not the revelation of the Holy Spirit, nor words directly from the Holy Spirit. They were simply Paul's exhortation consolation, and encouragement to the churches during the time he worked, as well as a record of his many works. Everything he said that edified others and had a positive effect was correct, but his words did not represent the words of the Holy Spirit and did not represent God. To regard man's letters the record of man's experiences as words spoken by the Holy Spirit to all of the churches is a grave misunderstanding and the worst kind of blasphemy. He was not a prophet or a foreteller, just a working apostle, a sent apostle, 
And so his own work and the life of his brothers and sisters were what mattered most to him. So he could not speak on behalf of the Holy Spirit. His words were not the words of the Holy Spirit, much less the words of God. Because he was merely one of God's creations and not God incarnate. His identity was different from that of Jesus, whose words were the Holy Spirit's words, God's words. For Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. How could Paul be his equal? If people hold the letters or words like Paul's to be the utterance of the Holy Spirit and worship them as God, it shows that they are too undiscriminating. To put it baldly, are they not purely blasphemers? How can a human being speak on behalf of God? How can people prostrate themselves before the letters and words of a man, holding them to be a holy book, a heavenly book? Do God's words simply fall off of man's lips? How can man speak on God's behalf? Brothers and sisters, now we can see which words are indeed the words of God and which are the words of men. In the past, we trusted and worshipped the Bible too much. We believed the Bible was God's inspiration and that it was His word. And we thought it was composed by God, but that was a terrible mistake. Without truth, men are easily deceived. We don't know how to tell God's words from the words of men and insist on calling man's words the words of God. That is simply grave ignorance. Paul was merely a servant sent by God. He was not God incarnate. He could never express the words of God. If men have put Paul's words on par with God's words, then they are seriously offending God's disposition. For so long our belief in the Lord was actually shaped by Paul's words, and so were our works. We treated Paul's words as God's words and ignored the words of Lord Jesus. Now I finally understand. We were following a man and worshiping a man. Yes. We mistook Paul for a God-man. Paul occupied the most space in our hearts. We had little room left for the Lord Jesus. How is that believing in the Lord? That's believing in Paul. In the past, we just blindly trusted and worshipped Paul, and we mistook his words for the words of God. We were ignorant fools. We were following a man, letting a man guide us. That isn't believing in the Lord. Yes, that's following a man and worshipping a man. How could our faith in the Lord not be misguided? We believed according to Paul's teachings. How could we become followers of God's will? Brother Paul's words may not be the words of God, but after he was called, he spent his life preaching and suffering for the Lord. He traveled so far and labored so hard to establish the Lord's churches. His contributions to the church are played for all to see. Amen. His faith in the Lord and his sufferings are something that all Christians should be emulating. Will you go so far as to deny that? Exactly. After he was shown by the light, he dedicated his life to the Lord's work. Every Christian recognizes that fact. Do you dare to deny it now? The Lord Jesus himself appeared to Paul and made him an apostle. He did so much for the Lord, and he risked his life so many times and suffered so much persecution. Come on, don't you know about that? Brothers and sisters, most people only see in Paul's letters the fact that he suffered for his preaching. But they don't really understand his nature and substance. We all know that while Jesus was working, Paul was the chief persecutor who hated the truth and resisted the Lord Jesus. Even Paul himself didn't dare deny that. The Lord Jesus preached so many sermons and performed so many miracles. Why did Paul still hate him and resist him? Why was he obsessed with catching and persecuting his disciples? This shows us that Paul, by his nature and substance, hated the truth and hated God. 
Why did he protect the interests of the chief priests and the Pharisees so fiercely? And why was he so loyal to Judaism? This shows us that he was only concerned with his position, not with God. For a higher position, he would rather resist the true God and persecute the believers. He would pay any price to gain rewards within Judaism. What kind of man is this? It isn't hard to decipher. Brothers and sisters, let's all think about it. Against what backdrop was Paul sent forth as an apostle to preach the gospel? While he was engaged in his mad pursuit of the Lord Jesus' disciples, the Lord had to appear to him in the sky, blinded him with the great light and brought him to his knees. The Lord did not appear to Paul because of his devotion, did he? He appeared in order to punish Paul. Paul forced his hand. He was forced to labor and suffer for him because the Lord Jesus had appeared to him. And his goal was penance. He saw that the Lord was almighty, that he could blind him and make him kneel before him. He agreed to sacrifice for the Lord because he feared being sent to hell as punishment. If the Lord Jesus had not appeared to him, based on his devilish nature of savagely resisting Lord Jesus, would he have followed the Lord and labored for him? Absolutely not. And so, Paul's faith in the Lord Jesus was not genuine, and his suffering and laboring was not done willingly. He was forced. He had no choice. Viewed this way, Paul's suffering and working for the Lord weren't done willingly. They weren't out of true devotion to the Lord. We thought of him as an example to follow. Doesn't that mean that we are resisting the Lord like Paul? We've been so blind, haven't we? Before, we only saw Paul's outward suffering, but never pondered his true nature. We were deceived by him. This dissection about Paul today is backed up by facts. If we look at Paul's nature and then at all he said and how he suffered, we see a lot of impurity and too much falseness. He really deceived us. I can't agree with that at all. Even if Brother Paul wasn't perfect, the Lord has forgiven his past sins. He worked for the Lord many years. No man suffered more and paid a higher price. That must have been approved by the Lord. Brother Paul is still an example to follow. That's right. Brother Paul was the greatest apostle. He suffered the most and did the most to spread the Lord's name. He is an example for all Christians. If Brother Paul couldn't be approved by God, what man could gain God's approval? Brother, dare we say Paul's suffering must be approved by God? Do we know the intents and the goals behind his suffering? I think Paul's suffering was purely penance. It was forced, and it was to gain the crown and the rewards. How could the Lord accept such suffering? The Lord is righteous and sees into the hearts of men. Men didn't see through Paul, but God saw through him. So should people not believe that God is righteous? Why do men praise and worship Paul? and hold him up as an example. Isn't that resisting Lord Jesus? Why do people try to justify Paul's actions? What does that say? Are they speaking for the Lord Jesus? Do they have a true faith in the Lord? Paul's laboring and suffering for the Lord happened unwillingly. We all admit that. But you're saying that in essence, Paul hated the truth and opposed God. I don't agree. What do you base that claim on? Right. Why do you claim that Brother Paul hated the truth and resisted God? Explain yourselves. That's right. You say Paul hated the truth. We want an explanation. How did Paul hate the truth? Where is your proof? Show us proof. Brothers, sisters, as to whether or not Paul hated the truth and opposed God, there are provable facts. While the Lord Jesus worked among men, he expressed many truths and performed many miracles that shocked all of Judea. With Paul's qualities, he should have recognized what the Lord Jesus did came from God. But Paul never verified it or sought the way of the Lord Jesus. 
He preached everywhere and publicly opposed the Lord Jesus. When the Lord Jesus was nailed to the cross, the sky turned black, the earth shook, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And the Lord Jesus appeared to people for 40 days after resurrection. These two greatest miracles shocked everybody in Judea. And the disciples also performed many miracles in the name of Lord Jesus. Paul saw all of these things, but still refused to admit that Lord Jesus was God, and instead resisted him more fiercely. He asked for letters from the chief priests himself, madly resisted, and persecuted the Lord Jesus' disciples. It seemed that he would have killed all the followers of the Lord Jesus and resisted him to the death. That is more than enough to prove that Paul was a man who deliberately resisted God and devoted himself to disrupting God's work. He hated the truth and opposed God by nature and substance. Or else, why would he have made an enemy of the Lord Jesus who came to express the truth? Let's look at Almighty God's exposure about Paul's nature and substance. Almighty God says, At the very mention of Paul, you may think of his history and of some inaccurate and spurious stories about him. He was taught by his parents from childhood and received my life, and because of my predestination, he was possessed of the qualities required by me. However, his flaw was that, because of his innate gifts, he often talked boastfully. And so, because of his disobedience, part of which directly represented the archangel, when I became flesh for the first time, he did his utmost to resist me. Because from the beginning, he was a persecutor of Christ and disobedient to Christ. He had always been a rebel who was deliberately opposed to Christ and had never known the working of the Holy Spirit. When his work was nearing its end, still he did not know the working of the Holy Spirit, but acted solely according to his own willful nature, paying not the slightest attention to the will of the Holy Spirit. And so he was by nature hostile to Christ and disobedient to the truth. How could such a man be saved who was rejected by the working of the Holy Spirit, who did not know the work of the Holy Spirit and resisted Christ. Brothers and sisters, the words of Almighty God have revealed Paul's nature so thoroughly. Paul was a man who deliberately resisted Christ and made an enemy of God. And Paul never actually knew the Lord Jesus. His savage resistance to Lord Jesus was due to his hatred of God and of the truth expressed by the Lord Jesus. Viewed in this way, Paul truly hated the truth and resisted God by nature and substance. Yes, that's right. Paul's resistance to the Lord Jesus before the light shone on him was abominable. This is proof of Paul's malicious nature. He was ten times worse than the Pharisees who resisted the Lord Jesus. A man like that could never have loved the truth. If someone who loved the truth heard the teachings of Lord Jesus, how could he hate and resist them? These facts are enough to prove that Paul hated God and hated the truth. His nature and his substance was exactly that of an antichrist. Lord Jesus used a man like this to do the service. This is proof of his almightiness. The facts regarding Paul's resistance to the Lord are clearly explained in the Bible. Why didn't we see what Paul really was? We've been so ignorant. From the evil deeds by which Paul resisted the Lord Jesus, it's evident that Paul's nature is that of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. These words revealed Paul's nature so thoroughly. They truly come from God. I've never heard them before. We really shouldn't worship men so carelessly. The sins you speak of were all committed before Paul was called into God's service. But after he saw the light, he preached the Lord's gospel everywhere and wrote so many letters to support the believers. That proves that Paul already repented. Amen. 
You cannot judge Paul as an enemy of the Lord Jesus based on his actions before he turned to the Lord. Amen. Amen. To spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus, Paul traveled half of Europe. He established countless churches and led countless people to the Lord's salvation. Is that not enough to show that he truly repented? Amen. You can't say Paul is a man who resists God based on what he did before his calling. That is unfair to Brother Paul. We don't accept your opinions. We don't. Brothers and sisters, after Paul saw the light, he preached for many years and wrote many letters. But that doesn't actually prove that he truly repented. Within his letters, we don't see any real reflection upon or even awareness of his evil deeds in resisting the Lord Jesus or arresting his disciples. He merely admitted that he was a chief sinner. He never spoke about his nature and substance. And he never dissected for what purpose and reason he resisted the Lord Jesus. There wasn't a single word from him on those matters. Does that sound like someone who truly repented? Why did Paul answer the calling of Lord Jesus and work for him? The truth is, he was completely unwilling. He knew that if he didn't agree, he would be punished and he would die. The suffering he underwent to preach the gospel was merely penance. Can a man merely paying for his sins have true repentance? Also, we can clearly see from reading Paul's letters that within his preaching, he never exalted or testified Jesus. He never testified how the Lord Jesus saved people, supplied people, and led people. And he never testified that the Lord Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life, that he is God's appearance, God become flesh to do his own work. Paul never testified to the loveliness of the Lord Jesus, and never testified to the suffering and humiliation Lord Jesus bore to save man. He never preached of or testified to the whole truth the Lord Jesus expressed, or the words he spoke. Nor did he exhort believers to obey the words of the Lord Jesus, to abide by the whole truth expressed by him, to follow him, serve him, and testify him. Nor did he fellowship about the substance of the work of the Lord Jesus and the fruits of it, or about how to follow the Heavenly Father's will to enter the kingdom of heaven. Instead, he willfully explained the work of the Lord Jesus, and misinterpreted his words. Many of the things he said gravely disrupted and disturbed the work of God in the age of grace. Can any of that prove he truly repented? The work of Paul did not lead believers before the Lord Jesus to experience his words or understand that Lord Jesus is the appearance of God. Instead, he exalted and testified of himself, led the believers before himself, and made them worship him. Isn't that exactly the way of the Pharisees? These facts are more than enough to prove that Paul never truly repented. What they are saying are indeed facts. Paul didn't testify of the Lord Jesus' words in his letters, but he often testified about how much work he did or how much he suffered. Isn't that exalting himself to make others worship him? It seems Paul was never truly repentant. Hmm. Without this fellowship, we never would have understood this. Indeed, we were deceived by Paul's outward suffering. Paul never exalted or testified the Lord Jesus. About what you say, I don't accept. Brother Paul wrote so many letters. Weren't they all testifying Lord Jesus? Brothers and sisters, it's true that Paul wrote many letters, but he never exalted or testified the Lord Jesus. Even when the Lord Jesus was mentioned, Paul was testifying of himself and using the name of Christ. For example, he often said in his letters, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. What Paul meant by that was that he was made an apostle of Christ by God's will, not by the will of Lord Jesus. But did God in heaven call Paul? No, it was the Lord Jesus who called. The Lord Jesus did not call Paul in the identity of God. He called Paul as Christ. But Paul said he was an apostle by the will of God. He did not believe the Lord Jesus Christ and God are one. In Paul's letters, God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit are always separate. He believed that God is God and Christ is Christ, that God is higher than Christ 
and the Heavenly Father is the greatest. So Paul believed in the God in heaven, not in the incarnate Christ. Paul had no knowledge of the Lord Jesus, so he never exalted the Lord Jesus Christ as God. He never exalted or testified the words of Jesus Christ were God's words. He never asked people to magnify Lord Jesus in their heart. Viewed in this way, did Paul really believe in Christ? Was he following Christ or testifying Christ? No. The nature of Paul's such doings was grave. According to the word of the Apostle John, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. This passage of Scripture tells us those who do not believe that God becomes incarnate are Antichrists. Paul only believed in the God in heaven, but he didn't truly believe in Christ. That means that he was a non-believer in the work of Jesus Christ. Waving the flag of an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, Paul exalted and upraised himself in all aspects, always attempting to stand equal with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is sufficient proof of Paul's wild ambition. He had not the slightest reverence or obedience to the Lord Jesus. His nature as a hater of truth and resister of God didn't change at all. This is even more proof that he never truly repented. Hmm, yes, it's true that Paul often started his letters with, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. In doing so, Paul was separating Jesus Christ and God. The Lord Jesus said, Believe me, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. I and my Father are one. Paul did not understand that Jesus Christ is God himself. From this, we can see that Paul didn't know Jesus Christ, making him even less capable of testifying him. Paul didn't understand that Jesus Christ is God appearing in the flesh. He separated Jesus Christ and God. That is a serious problem. And without this fellowship, we wouldn't have known it. Yes. In all his years of preaching, Paul never preached or testified of the words of Lord Jesus. And he never fellowshiped with the churches about the truth the Lord Jesus expressed. We really wonder how many of the words of the Lord Jesus were in Paul's heart. Based on that, we can be certain that Paul wasn't a man who pursued the truth because he didn't put experiencing the words of Lord Jesus first. He didn't practice those words. He relied on gifts, man's actions and deeds, man's knowledge and capabilities to spread the gospel. How could he be one who pursues the truth? No wonder he had no knowledge of, no true love for, and no true obedience to Jesus. After many years of working, his old nature remained unchanged. Instead, he became more arrogant and mercenary. He worked and suffered to make people emulate and worship him, and to build capital to engage in dealings with God. It's just like what Paul himself said. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Those words completely reveal what Paul hoped to gain from his years of work. He just wanted rewards and a crown. Paul never pursued the truth or transformation in his disposition. The goals he pursued and his satanic nature never altered. His way was exactly the way of the Pharisees. These are all sufficient to prove that Paul never truly repented. The Lord Jesus called Paul to give him a chance to repent and used him to spread the gospel. The Lord Jesus conquered Paul who had a devilish nature. This shows us his almightiness and shows us that God can put any man into service for his work. Their exploration into Paul's nature, which was hostile to the truth and resistant to God, is very thorough. No matter how we look at it, Paul never truly repented. I've walked Paul's way and served the Lord for more than 20 years. How have I been wrong? Oh Lord, 
What way am I to walk now? You say Paul never truly repented. But Paul said he was Christ as he lived. When we emulate him, we're emulating Christ. That can't be wrong. Amen. The apostles' letters in the Bible are all God's words and are inspired by God. So their words carry the same weight as those of Lord Jesus. And they were all Christ as they lived. Jesus Christ is the incarnate Christ. And the apostles as they lived were also Christ. Both of them are Christ. Amen. Amen. Sister Lou, when did we ever say all of the apostles were Christ? How can you even say that? Didn't we say the apostles' letters were all the word of God? If the apostles weren't Christ, how can their words then be the words of God? Sister Lou, how can you be so confused? Today, these two brothers from the Church of Almighty God have made themselves so clear. Not the whole Bible is inspired by God. The apostles' letters are the words of men not the words of God. The apostles were not Christ. But Paul said he was Christ as he lived. Explain that! Hey, Sister Liu, don't get angry. Sit down and say what you have to say. It's okay. Brothers and sisters, Paul said he was Christ as he lived, but this word was his own. The Holy Spirit didn't testify to that, nor did Lord Jesus say such a thing. Neither did other apostles testify that Paul was Christ as he lived. There's no way to make that assertion based on Paul's words. None of the ancient saints and prophets dared claim they were Christ as they lived. Only Paul dared to say it. From this, we can see his unreasonable arrogance. In the Age of Grace, the Holy Spirit testified the Lord Jesus as Christ. The redemptive work of the Lord Jesus, the disposition he expressed, and all that he has and is completely proved his identity as the Christ, while Paul was the chief persecutor who hated the truth and resisted God. That he said he was Christ as he lived proved he didn't know Christ at all. Brothers and sisters, then what actually is Christ? And so for the answer, we can turn to the words of Almighty God. Almighty God says, God incarnate is called Christ. Christ is the flesh the Spirit of God is clothed with. And this flesh is different from any fleshly man. The difference is because Christ is not of the flesh, but is the embodiment of the Spirit. He has a normal humanity and full divinity. And his divinity is something that no man possesses. His normal humanity is for maintaining all of his normal activities in the flesh. And his divinity is for doing God's own work. Both his humanity and his divinity obey the will of the Heavenly Father. The substance of Christ is the spirit that is divinity. And so, his substance is the substance of God himself. God become flesh is called Christ. And so, the Christ that can give people the truth is called God. There is nothing excessive about this, for he possesses the substance of God and possesses God's disposition and wisdom in his work that are unattainable by man. Those who call themselves Christ, yet cannot do the work of God, are frauds. Christ is not merely the manifestation of God on earth, but instead the particular flesh assumed by God as he carries out and completes his work among man. This flesh is not one that can be replaced by just any man, but one that can adequately bear God's work on earth and express the disposition of God and well represent God and provide man with life. From God's words we can see that only God incarnate is called Christ. Christ is God's spirit realized in the flesh. Christ is the appearance of God and is God made flesh to do his own work. So, Christ is God. 
Christ can give man the truth and provide man with life and can express God's righteous disposition and his working wisdom. Christ is the holy, righteous God himself. The life of Christ is inborn. Christ is born God incarnate. No man can become Christ by practicing his faith in the Lord. Born as Christ, he is Christ forever. Not born as Christ, one can never become Christ. No matter how people pursue the truth, they can never become Christ. The life of Christ is something that no created being and non-created being can possess or achieve. Paul said he was Christ as he lived. But did he possess God's disposition and all that he has and is? Could he express the truth to save man? If he possessed the life of Christ, then why did he sin and resist Jesus? Paul admitted himself that he was a chief sinner. How can a chief sinner be Christ as he lived? Isn't this blasphemy? Even if someone suffers and labors, can they become Christ? Isn't this a fallacy? Paul was the chief persecutor who resisted Christ. This is widely known. Yet in his later years, he testified that he was Christ as he lived, in an attempt to take the place of Jesus Christ. How could such a brood of Satan, who rebelled against God at every step, become Christ? He claimed he was Christ as he lived. It was nothing but a lie. It's an expansion of his satanic ambition, and it fully exposed his attempt to be God. He wanted to supplant Christ's place in people's hearts, which makes his antichrist nature abundantly clear. The path Paul walked was the path of an antichrist. That's indeed the yes. fact. That Paul of course, is how could I have not seen it before? That's indeed That's Paul is not who we should be following. Not false. It's this true. is not the way. What they're saying makes sense. It seems that Paul's claim that he was Christ as he lived is indeed wrong. Paul's pursuit wasn't after God's heart, but... But Paul suffered so much in his labor and ministry. Was all that suffering in vain? Oh, Lord. Thank the Lord. The Holy Spirit's inspiration is in your fellowship today. I understand what Christ is, and I have learned about Paul's substance. I have learned so much today. Paul is not Christ, and his claim that he was Christ as he lived is so arrogant. Yes. Christ is the appearance of God and is God himself. No man can call himself Christ. Paul dared to say that he was Christ as he lived. He wanted to become God, to take the place of Lord Jesus. Talk like that is very dangerous. Yes. Hmm. I never thought Paul was so ambitious. He even dared to say he was Christ as he lived. Didn't the archangel himself say such things? That exposes his nature as an antichrist. Right. Yes, we've been so foolish. Paul said so many absurd things, and we couldn't discern them. Today, if it hadn't been for these mm -hmm. two brothers' fellowship about Almighty God's words, which has helped us understand what Christ is and see through the true nature of Paul, we would still be blinded by Paul's outward preaching and suffering. Brother, today these two brothers from the Church of Almighty God fellowshiped a lot. And you should have seen that the substance of Paul is the same as the Pharisees. The way Paul walked was the way of an antichrist. If you continue your pursuit according to Paul's words, rather than follow the Lord's way and accept all of Almighty God's end-time word, then you'll be the same as Paul, a Pharisee who served God yet resisted God. How will you enter the kingdom of heaven? All right, that's enough. I believe the Lord is righteous. I've served the Lord for more than 20 years. I don't believe the Lord will abandon me. Brother, after all you've heard, why are you still so stubborn about this? Does hard working mean you're following the Heavenly Father's will? If you refuse to reject Paul's words and receive Almighty God's way of truth in the last days, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. 
and will be finally punished for resisting God. What gives you the right to lecture me? I've served the Lord for years, and I know more than you. You are an apostate. The Lord Jesus said, He who does the Heavenly Father's will can enter the kingdom of heaven. You've abandoned the way of Lord Jesus and followed Paul and replaced his teachings with Paul's words. It is you who are the real apostate. It is Paul who you worship. Paul is now your idol. When Almighty God came and pushed down your idol, you are unable to stand it. You do not love the truth. Fun Guoming, why do you always oppose my opinions and then stand against me? Are you really my brother? You are not my brother. You are now my enemy. You and I don't walk the same path. You see me as your enemy. You reject the truth. The Pharisees are your brothers. You are a modern Pharisee. You dare call me a Pharisee? You're expelled from the church now. You are no longer part of the church. You are banished from my church. But I'll still believe in God. When Almighty God Incarnate expresses the truth to save man, if you refuse to accept, you are a Pharisee. You've revealed yourself as a Pharisee. You! Leave now! Never enter my home again! Guo Yi! Feng Guo Yi, you expelled Guo Ming from the church. Is this how you follow the Lord's teachings? You are far too arbitrary. It seems you are the ruler of the church, expelling whoever you want. Is there still a place for the Lord in your heart? Is there a shred of fear for God? Guoming is an apostate. He betrayed Lord Jesus, so I must expel him. And I won't just expel him. I will draw a line between us. He is not my brother. He's an apostate? How can you say that? Guo Ming's fellowship was all about how to do the Heavenly Father's will. This fully conforms to the Lord's way. How can he be an apostate? A wild accusation! A wild accusation? I've served the Lord for over 20 years. Paul is always the example I follow. But he, he said today that Paul hated the truth. He made an enemy of God. And that Paul was a hypocritical Pharisee. <sighs> you... Paul is just an apostle. He is not God incarnate. And his words are not the truth. Why are you emulating Paul instead of emulating Christ? I don't understand you. Why do you defend Paul left and right? Why do you always exalt Paul instead of testifying Christ? Do you really think Paul can save you? You're being foolish. You! I can't relate to you at all. Oh Lord, I'm lost right now. Please give me your guidance. Oh Lord, do you never really approve of Paul? For so many years, I've emulated Paul, my Lord and try to pursue according to his words. 
Have I been believing in God in the wrong way all this time? Oh Lord, is being saved through faith enough to enter the kingdom of heaven? What does it mean to be saved? What is entering the kingdom of heaven? What kind of people can enter the kingdom of heaven? Oh Lord, I don't understand any of this. I beg for your inspiration. Please show me the way forward. Oh Lord, Ming, last time you talked about salvation and entering the kingdom of heaven, your brother wasn't able to accept it. But to me, it's in accordance with the truth, and it sounds so right. I've always wanted to understand these things, so I made time to come over here today, so we could discuss it some more. Thank God, Sister, Guaming, and I had wanted to go to your house to discuss this with you. Sister, Almighty God's end-time word has revealed every mystery. All we must do is truly seek. God will inspire and lead us. Yes. Let's read the words of Almighty God. Okay. Page 609. Guo Yi, I've been reading a lot of Almighty God's words. These words are what the Spirit says to the churches, which are prophesied in Revelation. The words of Almighty God have revealed all the mysteries in the Bible. What is being saved? What is doing the will of the Heavenly Father? And how to be saved into the kingdom of heaven? All these truths and mysteries are revealed. This is the voice of God. Almighty God is the returned Lord Jesus. Why not read the words of Almighty God? Consider them and seek the truth. Don't mention the Eastern Lightning to me again. I don't want to hear about it. Guo Yi, why aren't you seeking the truth at all? Do you know the consequences if you go on believing like this? You refuse to investigate it. You prevent the flock from returning to Almighty God. You are the ferocious tenant the Lord Jesus spoke of, the evil servant. Don't you know that? Don't think that you love the Lord and do the Heavenly Father's will. What you are doing now is the same as what the Pharisees did, Guo Yi. You are condemning God and resisting God's work. And if you still don't repent, you'll end up just like the Pharisees, Guo Yi. I'm an evil servant? You say I'm a Pharisee? In the past 20 years, how much have I suffered? What price have I paid? Isn't that loving the Lord? Isn't that doing the Heavenly Father's will? Is this how you express your love? How you show obedience? 
You suffer and pay your price so you can enter the kingdom of heaven. You do it for blessings, for a reward. Your belief is tainted with selfishness. That's good behavior? Is it really so? You want to use it to buy blessings into the kingdom of heaven. You're selfish and base. You're not doing the heavenly Father's will. You're a hypocrite. You're a Pharisee. You're a typical Pharisee. Am I wrong to suffer and shepherd the flock for the Lord? I don't believe the Lord will abandon me. The Lord Jesus exposed the Pharisees. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You exalt Paul's words all the time, but abandon God's commandments. Aren't you just the hypocritical Pharisee the Lord Jesus talked about? Isn't this misleading to people? You mistake man's teachings for God's word and make people obey them. Do you even know what the consequences are? You are rejecting the truth and resisting God. Do you think that your suffering has made you holy? That your price will get you into God's kingdom? You're just like the whitewashed tombs the Lord Jesus exposed. Beautiful on the outside, but filled with dead men's bones. Pursuing like this will not only keep you from the kingdom of heaven, but also stop others from entering. God's disposition won't tolerate this. The Lord Jesus said, Woe to you, you blind guides. How dare you lecture me? You! Hey, Guo Yi. Guo Ming, don't talk to your brother like that. Please calm down. Come on, Guo Yi, don't be angry. Sit don't down. Don't touch me. You're an adult, Guo Yi. Try to remain sensible. I'll read you Almighty God's words. I don't want any arguing or fighting today. Let's quiet our hearts before God. Let's all just sit down and have a good, peaceful fellowship. Come, Guo Yi, don't be angry. Sit down. Why should I sit? Go ahead, read. I can stand and listen. Read. Go ahead, read. Read. Go ahead. Don't worry about me. Go, start reading. I'm listening. Guo Yi, I'm going to start. Just listen. Go ahead, please read. Why does one believe in God? Most people are confused about this question. They hold two entirely different viewpoints regarding the practical God and the God in heaven. This points out that people do not believe in God in order to submit to God. Rather, they slightly submit to God in order to obtain certain benefit or to escape disaster. Such submission is based on certain conditions with their own future as prerequisite and is not self-motivated. What then is the root cause of your believing? If it is merely for the sake of your future or fate, then it is best that you do not believe. Such belief of yours is just fooling yourself, nothing more than a way of self-comfort and self-appreciation. Hmm, okay, not bad. Read, I'm listening. If your belief in God is not built upon the foundation of submission to God, you will eventually be punished for your resistance to God. All who believe in God but do not seek to submit to Him are those who resist God. God requires man to seek the truth, to thirst for His Word, to eat and drink of His Word, and to practice His Word, all intended for man to submit to Him. If this is indeed your intention, God will surely lift you up and show favor upon you. This cannot be doubted and changed by anyone. If your intention is not to submit to Him, but you have an ulterior motive, then what you say and do, your prayers before God, and even your behaviors, are resisting God. Even if you speak tenderly, act with a mild manner, your actions and expressions appear appropriate to others, 
and you give an impression that you submit. Yet as far as your intention, your view of belief in God is concerned, all you do are against God and are evil. Outwardly, you are submissive like a lamb, but you are evil-minded. Such a person is wolf in sheepskin, and he offends God directly. Hey, you see? Ha! Huh. Almighty God has explained things so clearly. He doesn't need to lecture people. Now you too. All you do is lecture and argue with me every day. You're always on the attack. How can I take in anything? You're always lecturing me. How can I keep calm? You see, look how nicely Almighty God explained it. So reasonable. And you too. Why should I listen to your yelling? Does this mean you admit they're the words of God? There. What are you talking about? When did I not admit it? When have I ever said they weren't God's words? You two never understand me. You pin on for labels on me. Oh my, it took a while, but you finally said something sensible. It's been so difficult. Was it all an act? Does that mean you agree to investigate this? Investigate? Investigate. Yes, I'll look into all this. If that's the case, I'll ask Brother Wong to come here. Hmm. When are they coming? They'll wait for your call. It's up to you. Just ask them to come to the church. Hmm. Right. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord, co-workers. Today I have gathered you here for another fellowship about being saved and entering the kingdom of heaven. We've fellowshiped several times before, but some of us had different interpretations. Today, I've invited two brothers from the Church of Almighty God to fellowship together with us. Guoming, introduce them to the brothers and sisters. Hmm. Praise God. Let me introduce these two brothers. This is Brother Wang. Praise God for giving us this great opportunity. We're so glad to fellowship with you all today. Thank, Thank the, the Lord. Lord. Ah. And this is Brother John. Brothers and sisters, nice to meet you. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Please sit. My co-workers, let us fellowship our different ideas about being saved and entering the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, this very important topic is clearly explained in the Bible. For with the heart man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Amen. Amen. We have been saved through our faith in Jesus Christ. Remember, once saved, always saved. When he comes, we will enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. We were saved when we accepted the Lord's salvation. Once saved, always saved. This is how we'll enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Here's my view on being saved and entering the kingdom of heaven. Once saved, one is always saved and will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is how we interpret God's work. But it is totally against God's word. Lord Jesus never said one can enter the kingdom of heaven after being saved by faith. But that only he who does the will of the heavenly Father will enter. Only the word of Lord Jesus is the authority and the truth. Man's imagination is not the truth, not the standard of entering the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, we say that we are saved by faith. 
But being saved only means our sins are forgiven. We won't be condemned or put to death by the law. It doesn't mean that we can follow God's way, break away from sin and be holy, nor that we can enter the kingdom of heaven. We are forgiven of our sins by faith, but the sins still remain. We can still sin and resist God, living in a circle of sinning and confessing. How can such people enter the kingdom of heaven? The Bible says, Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If a habitual sinner can enter the kingdom of heaven, it's against the real situation in heaven. Do we dare say there are filthy and corrupt habitual sinners in the kingdom of heaven? Have we ever heard of a filthy, evil person in the kingdom of heaven? The Lord is righteous and holy. Would he let a habitual sinner into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus once said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin, and the servant stays not in the house forever, but the son stays ever. Therefore, people bound by sin and who aren't holy can't enter the kingdom of heaven. If they can enter because they're saved by faith, then why did the Lord Jesus say, Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven? Why did he say he would separate sheep from goats and tares from wheat? Therefore, entering the kingdom of heaven after being saved by faith is untenable. This point of view contradicts the word of the Lord Jesus. Look, this is very simple. The Lord Jesus' salvation is like a rope. If we hold on to it tightly, we'll surely be brought into the kingdom of heaven. You don't have such faith. Are you worthy of getting in? Amen. Amen. That's right. We'll just rely on the Lord's salvation. By His grace alone, we'll enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. That's right. Brother Long, Sister Liu, I think you're wrong. We used to think we can enter the kingdom of heaven once we're saved. But after their fellowship, I feel it doesn't reflect the words of our Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus actually never said anything like that. This is just man's hope and our imagination. Brother Lang, Sister Liu, being saved is not the criteria. We still sin often and are not worthy to enter. The Lord said only he who does the will of the Heavenly Father can enter. Perhaps this idea isn't as simple as we had imagined after all. It is said in the Bible, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? Amen. Amen. This proves that the Lord Jesus has forgiven all our sins through his crucifixion. The Lord doesn't regard us as sinful. Then who can accuse us? Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? But we must be very clear. Who are the ones chosen by God? Those habitual sinners? Traitors? Those who steal from the offering? Fornicators? The fearful? And the hypocritical Pharisees? Are they the ones chosen by God? If anyone who believes in God is one he has chosen, then for the words in Revelation, For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and fornicators, and murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves, and makes a lie. How do we? Explain it. Therefore, not everyone who believes in God is chosen by God. Only those who truly serve the Lord and love God, and have real testimony, are ones chosen by Him. For example, Abraham, Job, and Peter are those who obeyed and feared God. They have righteous deeds and testimonies. They were approved by God. No one could accuse them. Yet when did God call all believers righteous? Most people often sin, resist, and betray God. This is a fact. Lord Jesus never called most of his believers righteous. And so... Those chosen by God refers to those who do righteous deeds and can follow God's will. I can't agree with what you've said. The Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. By faith in Jesus Christ, we are no longer condemned and will enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen.
Right. Whomever believes in Jesus will not be condemned. We will enter God's kingdom. Amen. Brother, we like to think our belief in Jesus Christ means we are already in him. This is our notion. In Christ Jesus doesn't refer to all believers in the Lord Jesus. Actually, most of them are not approved by God. Just as the Lord said, many are called, but few are chosen. Among those who are not chosen, some of them only eat the loaves and are filled. Some never love the truth, much less practice the truth. Some even perform evil against God, especially those religious leaders, most of whom walk the way of the Pharisees and are false shepherds against Christ. And some are just believers in name. So if we say all who believe in the Lord are in Jesus Christ, this is baseless. So who are the ones mentioned in the word of the Bible? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. They are those who abide by God's commandments, practice the truth, and obey God. In other words, they are the ones who pursue the truth and gain the life, are able to obey Christ, no longer do evil, and are completely compatible with Christ. Such people are those who are in Christ. It's not true that all believers in the Lord are in Jesus Christ. Some believe in God, but God doesn't acknowledge their belief. For instance, the Lord once said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Can we say that these people who preach cast out devils, and do many wonderful works in the Lord's name, are all in Christ? Aren't they just the ones condemned by God? So, believing in Jesus Christ and being in Christ are different. Believers who cannot be approved by the Lord are not ones in Christ. This is because God's work of saving man is not as what we've imagined, that all believers in God can be saved. Many of them will be eliminated, especially those who sin willfully after they know the true way, like people who steal offerings, who deny God, who betray God, who don't practice the truth, the fearful, and the fornicators. These people will still be condemned and eliminated. Those who engage in evil will be punished. Just like the Bible's Hebrews 10.26 says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. So, not everyone who believes in the Lord is in Christ. But they are those who love the truth and pursue the truth, and obey Christ and have true knowledge of Him, have no notion, no disobedience, and no resistance against Christ, can make Christ's heart His own, and can do God's will. Only they are the ones who are in Christ, who are approved by God, and who can enter God's kingdom. You mean, believing in the Lord is not being in Christ, and that people in Christ won't be condemned doesn't refer to all believers, but those who do the will of the Heavenly Father, only they can enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, if people don't follow the Lord's word, and willfully sin and resist God, they'll still be condemned. This preaching is so practical and so profound. Having believed for years, I've never heard such preaching from any pastor or any elder. We should listen to it more. People are sinful, but the sin offering of the Lord Jesus is forever effective. As long as we confess, the Lord will forgive us. We are sinless in the Lord's eyes, so we will enter the kingdom of heaven. Exactly. The Lord Jesus has forgiven all of our sins, and we will definitely enter. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus did forgive our sins, but it doesn't mean we aren't sinful, or we've broken free from the shackles of sin and become holy. The Lord Jesus has forgiven our sins, but what does sin mean here? We all know things like fornication and theft, which are against the law, the commandments, and God's word. All are sins. 
Anything that resists God, condemns God, and judges God are also sins. Not to mention blasphemy against God, which is unforgivable. In the age of grace, the Lord Jesus made himself the sin offering for mankind. Only by praying, confessing, and repenting to the Lord would people not be condemned or put to death. In other words, God no longer took them as sinners. And mankind could pray to the Lord directly and enjoy his grace due to his forgiveness. This is the real meaning of sins are forgiven. Although man's sins are forgiven because of the sin offering made by the Lord Jesus, it doesn't mean that man will no longer sin or resist God. Because man's sinful nature still remains. He can still resist God, betray God, and make an enemy of him. How could he be qualified to enter the kingdom of heaven? Like Almighty God's word says, Can you, a sinner who has just been redeemed, be after God's heart without having been transformed and perfected by Him? It is true that you, who are an old man, have been saved by Jesus. You are not of sin, thanks to God's salvation. But that does not prove that you are devoid of sin or filth. How can you be holy if you have not been transformed? You are still filled with filth inside, are selfish and contemptible, and yet you want to descend with Jesus. Could there be such a good thing? You miss a crucial step in your faith. You have only been redeemed, but not transformed. To be a man after God's heart, God must personally work to transform you and purify you. Otherwise you, who have only been redeemed, cannot be holy. As such, you will not be qualified to share in the good blessings of God because you miss an important step in God's work of managing man, that of transforming and perfecting man. A merely redeemed sinner like you cannot directly receive God's inheritance. Brothers and sisters, the redemptive work Lord Jesus did was only to forgive men's sins, but it did not resolve their corrupt disposition. Satanic dispositions like arrogance, selfishness, and craftiness still remain within them. These corrupt dispositions are something deeper and more profound than sin. They're also the root of man's resistance to God. If these satanic corrupt dispositions are not resolved, people will still resist God and still judge and condemn God via their imagination and false notions. In persecution and tribulation, they'll still deny God and even betray Him just like Judas. If given power, they will form separate kingdoms to fight against God. Some will even steal God's offerings and offend His disposition and will be condemned by God and perish. Today, most pastors and leaders in the religious world do not follow the words of Lord Jesus. They willfully misinterpret the Bible, saying that man's words are God's words. They exalt man's word over those of Lord Jesus. So the believers all worship and follow man having no place in their hearts for the Lord, and are controlled firmly in their hands. Especially when the returned Lord Jesus does the work of judgment, these pastors and leaders not only refuse to seek or investigate, but instead condemn God's work, judge and blaspheme God. They also fabricate rumors to deceive the believers and seal off the churches, making an enemy of God and offending His disposition. This is the biggest resistance against God, this is an unforgivable sin. Their evil deeds are far more serious than those of the Pharisees who resisted the Lord Jesus. Yes. This proves that before man's nature of resisting God is resolved and his satanic corrupt disposition is purified, he can still perform any evil against God. How can such a person enter God's kingdom? Therefore, according to his plan of managing and saving mankind, and also corrupt mankind's needs, God expresses various truths in the last days. He begins the work prophesied in the Bible that judgment must begin at the house of God. To solve the problem that corrupt mankind is controlled by his satanic nature. In this way, man can gradually get rid of his satanic corrupt disposition and no longer disobey or resist God, and can truly obey and fear God, thus being purified and entering the kingdom of heaven.
According to what they're saying, I feel I am wearing robes of judgment, clothing myself in sin. Mm. It seems that man won't enter the kingdom of heaven unless he becomes sinless and holy. This is for sure. Even though we can avoid some obvious sins, we still often go against the Lord's word despite ourselves, act of our own accord and resist God. This is a fact. Hmm. We do need God to resolve our sinful nature with a further step yeah. of work. Yes. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus just did the work of redemption. So in the age of grace, no matter how much people read the Bible or pursued, they were in the bondage of sin and couldn't become holy. According to his steps of managing and saving mankind, God predestined in the last days that judgment begins at God's house to purify and transform men, to free them from sin and become holy. Let's read a paragraph of Almighty God's Word. Almighty God says, Though Jesus did much work among man, he only completed the redemption of all mankind and became man's sin offering, and did not rid man of all his corrupt disposition. Fully saving man from the influence of Satan not only required Jesus to take on the sins of man as the sin offering, but also required God to do greater work to completely rid man of his disposition, which has been corrupted by Satan. And so, after man was forgiven his sins, God returned to flesh to lead man into the new age and began the work of chastisement and judgment, which brought man to a higher realm. All those who submit under his dominion shall enjoy higher truth and receive greater blessings. They shall truly live in the light and shall gain the truth, the way, and the life. Through the sin offering, man has been forgiven his sins. For the work of the crucifixion has already come to an end and God has prevailed over Satan. But the corrupt disposition of man still remains within them and man can still sin and resist God. God has not gained mankind. That is why in this stage of work, God uses the word to reveal the corrupt disposition of man and asks man to practice in accordance with the right path. This stage is more meaningful than the previous one and more fruitful as well. For now it is the word that directly supplies life for man and enables the disposition of man to be completely renewed it is a stage of work more thorough. Therefore, the incarnation in the final age has fulfilled the significance of God's incarnation and completely finished God's management plan for the salvation of man. Great! Isn't it? Great! Almighty God's word is so good! From God's word we can see that the Lord Jesus' redemption lays a foundation of God's end-time salvation. And the end-time judgment is the core and emphasis of God's work of salvation. It's the most crucial and important work for saving mankind. Our experience of God's work in the age of grace can only make our sins forgiven, but can't help us out of sin to achieve holiness. Only God's end-time judgment can work all the truths mankind needs into them so that they can truly know God, have their disposition transformed, and become a mankind who can obey God, worship God, and be after God's heart. Thus ends God's management plan of saving mankind. Their preaching is irrefutable. The Eastern Lightning... 
really does have the truth. Brother, the more I hear, the more I feel. These words are good. Can I read Almighty God's word? Sure. Praise God. Praise God. Brother, Almighty God's word is good. Is it okay for me to read his word? I want to read too. Glory to God. Glory to God. Almighty God's word will be given freely to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want one too. Me too. Brother, I'd like to read too. Goi. Almighty God's word is the truth. Please read. Hmm. I was thinking about it. Praise God. Brother, please give me a copy. Thank God. Thank God. We were hoping you'd ask. Thank God. This is great. Brother Fan. I now see the authority of Almighty God's Word. It really can conquer man. It's this so wonderful. God's uplifting. Yeah, thank God. Thank the Lord. Thank, thank God. the Lord. Praise thank the God. Lord. This is great. Here, brother. Praise God. Thanks be to God. Please give me one copy. Sure. Praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brother Lang? Sister Liu? Sister Meng? Thank you. Praise, Praise God. the Lord. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Brother, please read God's, God's word. God's word is so good. I'd like one. Here. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Brother, I have one question. You said that for man to break free from sin and become holy, he must accept God's end-time judgment. Then how does God judge and purify man in the last days? Yeah, how does God work to purify man? For many years I have often wondered. What a joy to be without sin! Then life wouldn't be painful. Brothers and sisters, this is an important issue as to how Almighty God judges and how He purifies man in the last days. Let's read Almighty God's Word together. Please turn to page 7. Guoming, please read. Okay. When God becomes flesh this time, His work will be to express His disposition primarily through chastisement and judgment. Using this as the foundation, he brings more truth to man, shows more ways of practice, and so achieves his objective of conquering man and saving man from his corrupt disposition. This is what lies behind the work of God in the age of kingdom. In the last days, Christ uses a variety of truths to teach man, reveal the essence of man, and dissect his words and deeds. These words comprise various truths, such as man's duty, how man should obey God, how man should be loyal to God, how man ought to live out the normal humanity as well as the wisdom and disposition of God, and so on. These words are all focused on the essence of man and his corrupt disposition. In particular, those words that reveal how man spurns God are spoken in regards to how man is an embodiment of Satan and an enemy force against God. When God does the work of judgment, He does not simply make clear the nature of man with just a few words, but reveals, deals with, and prunes over the long term. Such manner of revelation, dealing, and pruning cannot be substituted with ordinary words, but with the truth that man does not possess at all. Only such manner of work is deemed judgment. Only through such judgment can man be persuaded 
be thoroughly convinced into submission to God and gain true knowledge of God. What the work of judgment brings about is man's understanding of the true face of God and the truth about his rebelliousness. The work of judgment allows man to gain much understanding of the will of God, of the purpose of God's work, and of the mysteries that could not be understood by man. It also allows man to recognize and know his corrupt substance and the roots of his corruption, as well as to discover the ugliness of man. These effects are all brought about by the work of judgment. For the substance of such work is actually the work of opening up the truth, way, and life of God to all those who have faith in Him. This work is the work of judgment done by God. Through this work of judgment and chastisement, man will fully come to know the substance of filth and corruption within him, and he will be able to completely change and become clean. Only in this way can man be worthy to return before the throne of God. All the work done this day is so that man can be made clean and be changed through judgment and chastisement by the word, as well as refining, man can be cast away his corruption and made pure. Rather than deeming this stage of work to be that of salvation, it would be more apt to say it is the work of purification. God does the work of judgment and the work of chastisement, so that people may know him and for the sake of his testimony. If he did not judge people's corrupt disposition, they could not possibly know his righteous and unoffendable disposition. Nor could they turn their old knowledge of him into a new knowledge of him. For the sake of his testimony and his management, he makes his everything known to all. So that, through his open appearance, people may know him and be transformed in their disposition and bear a resounding testimony for him. It is in the various works of God that one's disposition is transformed. If the disposition of man is not transformed, then he cannot testify to God or be after God's heart. The transformation of man's disposition marks his deliverance from the bondage of Satan and from the influence of darkness. It shows that he has truly become a model and specimen of God's work and has truly become a witness of God and a person after God's heart. These words are so excellent. I've never heard of such words. Very deep, very deep. Brothers and sisters, Brothers and sisters, in the last days, God expresses the truth to judge and chastise corrupt mankind. All the words God judges man with are the expression of his righteous disposition, what he has and what he is, and the words that can be man's life. Therefore, they are all truths. For corrupt mankind, these words of truth are judgment themselves, their chastisement, condemnation, and searching, and purification. With the word of truth, God purifies the satanic disposition within corrupt mankind and resolves their nature and substance of resisting God. This is the significance for God to purify, save, and perfect man with judgment. In the end-time judgment, Almighty God expresses truth and reveals all the mysteries of God's 6,000-year management plan and reveals the purpose of God's three-stage work of salvation and the substance of each stage of work. He also clearly points out the way for man's disposition to become transformed and purified. Meanwhile, 
He thoroughly reveals man's nature and substance, which are corrupted by Satan, plus the truth of his corruption and the root of his sin. Then man can understand that his nature is the very nature of Satan and sees that he is living in the likeness of Satan, the devil. So he truly repents and willingly accepts God's judgment, chastisement, trials, and refining and is led by God's word to pursue the truth and the transformation of his disposition. And he gradually breaks from the bondage of his satanic corrupt disposition, rebels against Satan, leaves the darkness, and returns to God. And so, man's sinful nature is radically resolved. What's more, by experiencing and practicing God's word, man gradually learns many truths, such as what is salvation, what is full salvation, what is doing God's will, what is following man's own path, what is following God, what is following man, what are Pharisees, whom God saves, and whom God eliminates. Most importantly, in the judgment and chastisement of God's word, man learns that God's righteous disposition is not to be offended. Because of knowing God, man comes to fear God and shun evil and live by God's word. As man understands the truth and knows God more deeply, he's more obedient to God and has more reality of practicing the truth. So man unknowingly breaks away from sin and becomes holy. This result can never be achieved in the Lord's believers who refuse to accept God's end-time work. So, only by accepting the judgment and chastisement of Almighty God's end-time word can man understand the truth and know God, break away from Satan's influence, abolish his satanic disposition, and live by the truth and God's word. This is the real meaning of being saved. Thank the Lord. Almighty God's word really can transform and purify man. This is surely God's work, because only God can transform and save man. No one except God can do the work of judging and purifying man. Right. All over the world, only the church of Almighty God testifies the Lord's return to judge and purify man. After their fellowship today, I believe Almighty God's end-time work is the true way. This fulfills the Lord's prophecy. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Hmm. The Lord Jesus has already paid the price for our sins. Now God has to judge and chastise man to resolve his sinful nature? I just don't understand. Brother, we've been believers for a long time, but we always involuntarily sin and resist the Lord. Living a life of sinning each day and confessing each night. Now, Almighty God has expressed the truth to purify man, to save us from the bondage of sin. But you don't have the heart to seek it. Ask yourself, is that right? Don't you desire to break free from sin? Or do you want to keep sinning and resisting the Lord? If we reject Almighty God's work of judgment, can we become someone who does the Heavenly Father's will and enter the kingdom of heaven? Just by holding on to the name of Lord Jesus and believing his promises without accepting Almighty God's work, I think we can still enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if we only accept the Lord Jesus' redemptive work in the age of grace, but reject Almighty God's end-time work of judgment and chastisement, then we can never break free from sin and become someone who does Heavenly Father's will and enters God's kingdom. This is beyond doubt. Because Jesus' work in the age of grace was redemption, he only gave man the way of repentance according to the stature of people at the time and let them understand some apparent truths and ways to practice. For example, confessing and repenting, bearing the cross, being humble and patient, sharing love, fasting, baptizing, and so on. These are limited truths that people during that time could receive and achieve. As to other deeper truths, for man's disposition to be transformed, to be purified, saved and perfected, and so on, the Lord Jesus did not express them. It's because people of that time had too small stature to bear them. Only when the Lord Jesus returns to work in the last days 
will he bestow all the truth for a corrupt mankind to be saved and perfected. According to God's management plan to save man and the needs of the corrupt mankind. As the Lord Jesus said, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. The words of Lord Jesus are very clear, that in the age of grace, He didn't give corrupt mankind all of the truths they needed for their salvation. There are many higher and deeper truths, the truths that free man from his corrupt disposition and make him holy, and truths like obeying God and knowing God. He didn't tell them these things in the age of grace. So, Almighty God has expressed these truths about saving man in the last days, to judge, chastise, purify, and perfect all those who accept his end-time salvation. Finally, he'll make them complete and bring them into God's kingdom. Only then will God's management plan to save man be thoroughly accomplished. If one only accepts the redemptive work of Lord Jesus, but rejects Almighty God's end-time work of judgment, he can never gain the truth and have his disposition transformed, nor become one who does God's will, much less be qualified to enter God's kingdom. In the last days, mankind has been fully corrupted by Satan, filled with satanic poisons within. Mankind's views, rules of living, outlook on life, and values are all against the truth and in opposition to God. They worship evil and have become God's enemies. For a mankind so consumed with Satan's corrupt disposition, if they are not severely judged, chastised, burned, and purified by Almighty God's Word, how can they rebel against Satan and break free of its influence? How can they fear God and shun evil and become one who does God's will? As we know, many longtime believers in the Lord passionately testify that Jesus is the Savior and labor hard for years. But because they don't know God's righteous disposition and have no fear of God, when Almighty God carries out His end-time work, they judge and condemn God's work, deny and reject God's return, and even re-crucify the returned Christ in the last days. Such facts are compelling evidence that if man rejects God's end-time judgment and chastisement, the root of his sinning and his satanic nature can never be resolved. And all mankind will perish because they resist God. This is an undeniable fact. While believing in God only if one accepts God's end-time judgment and chastisement, can he gain the truth as his life? and become one who does the Heavenly Father's will, can he know God and be compatible with him, and be qualified to enjoy God's promises and be brought into his kingdom? Brother, for those long-time believers who spend their lifetime for the Lord, if they reject Almighty God's end-time work, they still won't be taken into the kingdom of heaven? Brother Fon, I'm glad you've asked. Almighty God has given us a clear answer. Please turn to page 1460. If you do not seek the way of life provided by Christ of the last days, then you shall never gain the approval of Jesus and shall never be qualified to enter the gate of the kingdom of heaven. For you were both a puppet and prisoner of history. Those who are controlled by regulations, by letters, and shackled by history will never be able to gain life and will never be able to gain the perpetual way of life. That is because all they have is turbid water that has lain stagnant for thousands of years. Instead of the water of life that flows from the throne, those who are not supplied with the water of life will forever remain corpses, playthings of Satan, and sons of hell. How then can they behold God? If you only try to hold on to the past, only try to keep things as they are by standing still, and do not try to change the status quo and discard history, 
then will you not always be against God? The steps of God's work are vast and mighty, like surging waves and rolling thunders. Yet you sit and passively await destruction, sticking to your folly and doing nothing. In this way, how can you be considered someone who follows in the footsteps of the Lamb? How can you justify the God that you hold on to as a God who is always new and never old? And how can the words of your yellowed books carry you across the threshold of new age? How can they lead you to seek the steps of God's work? And how can they take you up to heaven? What you hold in your hands are the letters that can provide but temporary solace, not the truths that are capable of giving life. The scriptures you read are that which can only enrich your tongue, not words of wisdom that can help you know human life, much less the ways that can lead you to perfection. Does this discrepancy not give you cause for reflection? Does it not allow you to understand the mysteries contained within? Are you capable of delivering yourself to heaven to meet God on your own? Without the coming of God, can you take yourself into heaven to enjoy family happiness with God? Are you still dreaming now? I suggest then that you stop dreaming and look at who is working now, at who is now carrying out the work of saving man during the last days. If you do not, you shall never gain the truth and shall never gain life. Those who wish to gain life without relying on the truth spoken by Christ are the most ridiculous people on earth. And those who do not accept the way of life brought by Christ are lost in fantasy. And so I say that the people who do not accept Christ of the last days shall forever be despised by God. Christ is man's gateway to the kingdom during the last days, which none may bypass. None may be perfected by God except through Christ. You believe in God, and so you must accept His words and obey His way. You must not just think of gaining blessings without receiving the truth or accepting the provision of life. Christ comes during the last days so that all those who truly believe in Him may be provided with life. His work is for the sake of concluding the old age and entering the new one and is the path that must be taken by all those who would enter the new age. If you are incapable of acknowledging this and instead condemn, blaspheme, or even persecute him, then you are bound to burn for eternity and shall never enter the kingdom of God. Yeah, he's mm. right. Yeah, absolutely. God's yes. words yeah. really uh, carry right. authority. Mm-hmm. Almighty God's words are truly the words of God's judgment on man. Every word carries authority and majesty, makes man convinced and fearful. Almighty God's words are indeed the truth and can transform man. This is the way to be saved and to enter the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, Christ of the last days, Almighty God, has brought mankind the real way to eternal life. Almighty God is the Christ who appears in the last days, and He is man's gateway to the kingdom of heaven, which no one can bypass. Only if we accept the truth expressed by Almighty God can we gain life and do God's will and be brought into the kingdom of heaven and receive God's end-time salvation, just like what's written in Peter 1 who are kept by the power of God through faith to salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Praise the Lord. Now I understand. 
Almighty God has brought us the real way of eternal life and the practical way to enter the kingdom of heaven. Only if we accept Almighty God's way of eternal life can we become someone who does the Heavenly Father's will and enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Before, we mistook the apostles' words as truth, thinking that we could be saved by faith and enter the kingdom of heaven. Now I find that it's just unrealistic. If we reject Almighty God's way of eternal life and receive no truth or life from God, how can we enter the kingdom of heaven? We fail to keep pace with the Lamb's footsteps and stick to the words of the Bible. So how can we receive the living water and His provision of life? No wonder our belief has come to a dead end. We have actually been divorced from God's work. Of course. We've been lost at sea following the wrong directions. Thank the Lord. You all are right. As believers for many years, we've longed to enter the kingdom of heaven. Although we know Lord Jesus said, only those who do the will of the Heavenly Father can enter the kingdom of heaven. None of us knew the true meaning. Only the truth expressed by Christ of the last days, Almighty God, shows us the way to enter the kingdom of heaven, reveals to us the Heavenly Father's will, and uncovers all of the mysteries. So we understand many truths and have a more practical and accurate goal of pursuit. Brothers and sisters, Almighty God is the returned Lord Jesus. All the words of Almighty God are the truth, the Holy Spirit's expression, God's voice. We are so honored to receive the way of eternal life brought by Almighty God. This is God's loving grace and our blessings. We must never miss out on such an opportunity of a lifetime. Yes. Right, we are so mm -hmm. blessed. Yes. Just a minute. If we can't be taken into the kingdom of heaven, no matter how good, how high, how true your preaching is, I won't accept it. I will only hold on to the salvation of Lord Jesus. I'll just await the Lord to take me into the kingdom Amen. of heaven. You're right. We've been saved by our faith in Jesus Christ. The Lord has given us a beautiful promise. If we hold on to his name, we'll be saved by grace and enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Brother Fen, we don't need to listen to them. No matter how well they preach, we can't believe it. We have to hold on to the Lord's salvation. Brother Lang, Sister Leah, you both have it wrong. Doesn't man believe in God for gaining the truth in life? If we reject what we know to be the truth and stand in opposition to that, aren't we the same as the Pharisees? Hmm. Oh, oh yes, so that's exactly so. I agree. Was the truth. Brother Lang, Sister Liu, through their fellowships, I believe. Almighty God's work of expressing words to judge and purify man is God's work in the last days that judgment must begin at the house of God. And the truth that Almighty God expresses truly shows the way for man to break free of his sinful nature and be saved. We should not reject and resist God anymore. Anyone who deliberately refutes what he knows to be the truth is a Pharisee and is resisting God. You'd better quiet your heart and hear the rest of their message. Brother Wang, Brother Zhang, please continue to fellowship. Okay. If we accept Almighty God, will we enter the kingdom of heaven? To answer this, Almighty God's words make it clear. Let's first look at what Almighty God says about it. Everyone please turn to page 1434. The return of Jesus is a great salvation for those who are capable of accepting the truth. But for those who are unable to accept the truth, it is a sign of condemnation. You should choose your own path and should not blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and reject the truth. You should not be an ignorant and arrogant person, but someone who obeys the guidance of the Holy Spirit and longs for and seeks the truth. Only in this way will you benefit. I will let all who follow me know this fact. Those who cannot fully accept my words, those who cannot practice my words, those who cannot find a purpose in my words, and those who cannot receive salvation because of my words, 
are those who are condemned by my words, and moreover have lost my salvation, and my rod shall never stray from them. If you have faith in God, yet seek not the truth or the will of God, nor do you love the way that brings you closer to God, then I say that you are one who is trying to evade judgment. You are a puppet and traitor who flees from the great white throne. And God will not spare any of the rebellious that escape from under his eyes. Such men shall receive even more severe punishment. Those who come before God to be judged and be purified shall forever live in the kingdom of God. Of course, this is in the future. From Almighty God's words, we see that God saves man by principles. Not all those who accept Almighty God's work can be saved and enter the kingdom of heaven. Whether one can have a pleasant destination in the end depends on whether he loves the truth and pursues the truth, and whether he accepts and obeys God's judgment and chastisement, gains the truth from it, casts off his corrupt disposition, and is purified. God's judgment and chastisement in the last days is the only chance for corrupt mankind to be fully saved. Only those who love the truth, obey God's judgment, chastisement, trials, and refining, gain the truth, and are purified can be brought into God's kingdom. All those who don't accept the truth and can't obey God's judgment and chastisement are the ones God will cast away, and those engaged in evil ways will be punished. God's judgment in the last days is also his work of classifying all. Whether one can accept and obey God's judgment and chastisement and gain the truth and be purified involves the great matter of whether he can be saved and enter the kingdom of heaven. Whether one can accept God's end-time work has a bearing on his fate, destination, and outcome. Brothers and sisters, let's read another passage from Almighty God. Everyone, please turn to page 1452. Do you understand now what is judgment and what is truth? If you now understand, then I exhort you to submit to judgment. Otherwise, you shall never have the opportunity to be commended by God or to be taken by God into His kingdom. Those who only accept judgment but can never be purified, that is, those who flee in the midst of the work of judgment, shall forever be detested and rejected by God. Their sins are much more and more grievous than those of the Pharisees, for they have betrayed God and are rebels against God. Such men who are not worthy even to do service, shall receive more severe, everlasting punishment. God shall not spare any traitor who once claimed loyalty with words, yet then betrayed him. Such men shall see retribution through punishment of the spirit, soul, and body. Does this not reveal the righteous disposition of God? Is this not exactly the purpose of God's judgment and revelation of man? God shall place all those who perform all kinds of wicked deeds during the time of judgment in the place where evil spirits live, for their fleshly bodies to be destroyed at the will of the spirits. Their bodies shall give off the odor of a corpse, and such is their fitting retribution. God writes down in their record books each and every one of the sins of those disloyal, false believers, false apostles, and false workers. Then when the time is right, he casts them amidst the unclean spirits, so their entire bodies may be defiled by the spirits at will. And as a result, they will never be reincarnated, and shall never again see the light. Those hypocrites who do service at one time, but are unable to remain loyal to the end, shall be numbered by God among the wicked, so that they walk in the counsel of the wicked, 
becoming part of the disorderly multitude. In the end, God shall destroy them. God casts aside and takes no more notice of those who have never been loyal to Christ or dedicated any effort, and shall destroy them all. In the change of ages, they shall no longer exist on earth, much less gain passage into the kingdom of God. Those who have never been true to God, but are forced into dealing with God, shall be numbered among those who do service for his people. Only a small number of such men can survive, while the majority shall perish along with those who are not qualified even to do service. Finally, God shall bring into his kingdom all those who are of the same mind as God. The people and sons of God as well as those predestined by God to be priests. Such is the fruit begotten by God through His work. As for those who can belong to none of the categories set by God, they shall be numbered among the unbelievers. And you can surely imagine what their outcome shall be. I have already said to you all that I should say. The road that you choose shall be your decision to make. What you should understand is this. The work of God never waits for any that cannot keep pace with God. And the righteous disposition of God shows no mercy to any man. Almighty God's words really carry authority and are all an expression of the truth. No one else can speak these words. This is God's voice. Through his judgment in the last days, God reveals the fate of each man and classifies them. God is truly so wise and so righteous. From the judgment and exposure of Almighty God's word, I also see that I really engaged in evil ways according to my actions. I deserve to be cursed by God. Thank Almighty God for His salvation. I won't miss this opportunity again. Today I formally accept Almighty God as my Savior. No matter what my outcome is, I will follow Almighty God to the end. Brother Fan, praise, praise God. God. Praise God. Thank God. In all my years, I've never heard such good preaching. I am supplied in my spirit. I want to follow Almighty God and be a true believer in Him. Thank the Lord. The words expressed by Almighty God are the Lord's voice. Almighty God is the Lord Jesus we have been yearning for. I can wait no more. I accept Almighty God as my Savior now. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. Almighty God's words are so clear. This is the true way. What are we still waiting for, everyone? Right. Almighty God is the Lord Jesus we've desperately yearned for and have been waiting years for. Now that day has finally come. I truly thank the Lord for not forsaking us. Thank, thank God. God. Right. The Lord has finally come back. Come to take us. I never expected that I would see the Lord's return while I'm still alive. I am really so blessed. Praise, Praise God. God. Thank the Lord. Before... I always thought Peter and John were so privileged to listen to the Lord's preaching. Today, I am so honored to be able to personally listen to the words and utterance of the end-time Christ, Almighty God. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. <laughs> yes, we will read Almighty God's word carefully 
and accept God's judgment. We must cherish this opportunity to be saved and purified. Amen. 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 In my two decades of believing, I forsook everything to preach and work for the Lord. I bore the cross and subdued my body. I felt I was the same as Paul. I had finished the course and kept the faith, and a crown of righteousness would be laid up for me. I took this as the capital for my belief in the Lord and the basis of getting the crown and my rewards. Now I realize that I exalted and testified and sought to emulate Paul, and even took Paul's words as the truth and the life and stubbornly walked the way of Paul. Was I believing in the Lord? Wasn't I just believing in Paul and in myself? For many years, I worked hard for the Lord, fully convinced that I was His most loyal servant. But out of my expectations, I became an evil servant who led blindly. When the end-time work of the returned Lord Jesus, Almighty God, came upon me, I refused to seek or investigate, and instead, I resisted and condemned it. I even hindered and restricted believers from investigating the true way and expelled those who had accepted the true way from our church. I've done so much evil. Aren't I a hypocritical Pharisee revealed in the last days? How can someone like me expect to receive rewards and enter the kingdom of heaven when the Lord comes? I can't bear to think of the past. For so many years, I exalted and testified Paul, but never exalted and testified the Lord Jesus, much less followed the Lord's word or spread his word. I walked the way of all antichrists, serving God yet opposing Him. These evil deeds of opposing God pierce deep into my heart like thorns and cause me great pain. I never expected that I would welcome the Lord's appearance in such a way. I am so undeserving of the Lord. I am willing to accept the salvation of Almighty God, I will pursue the truth and make a new start to repay the love of Almighty God. <laughs> 